Hello everyone, welcome back to the next installment of Stoss's detailed Type 7C interior tour using the very nicely done um, in boat interior by uh, in Wolfpack by Usipator Games. Uh, as in the previous installments, what I will do is I'll go through, in this case, the tower and fire control system of the Type 7C. I'll go through and show what Wolfpack has, has made and then show it to the extent that there is something that maybe differs from reality. I'll show pictures to try to supplement that. Uh, and, that and again, that's not to, uh, by any means, to cast aspersions on uh, what Wolfpack has modeled here, but if anything, it's to just educate people um, using using you know their interior model as a vehicle, and then maybe also to provide suggestions to the devs if they do indeed want to um, make some changes or take suggestions or uh, add additional functionality, right? So kind of a multifaceted uh, goal there. Uh, so this installment, we'll take a look at the tower interior, very small compartment. Um, and so there's not a whole lot to cover in here. Uh, however, we will also uh, cover the fire control system in, in detail, in high detail. And that's actually, for that, we'll kind of run through the boat. Uh, and again, this is not the fire control system as it is implemented in Wolfpack. This is we're walking through the actual functionality of the entire fire control system. That is all of the components that are spread throughout the entire boat, not just the TDC. It's, it's very easy to... Uh, to assume that fire control means TDC only, that is not the case. There, it took several uh, guys, uh, pretty hefty personnel, uh, complement to um, operate the entire fire control system throughout the boat. And so we'll cover we'll cover that whole thing, and we'll also just cover a little background of this compartment here, the tower interior, as far as who stood um, who, who stood watch here and and who was on battle stations here. Okay, all right. So, starting at, as you walk up the tower ladder, uh, as you walk up the ladder from the control room, you are facing the starboard side of the boat, okay? And so, as you would come up here, you would take a left, and you would you turn the left, and you would see the helmsman station, the tower helmsman. Now, on a Type 7, and I, this actually goes for all, at least all World War II submarines from, the, from a German and from an American perspective that I'm aware of, uh, the main... Uh, helm station was in the tower. It was not in the control room, and there really was there was a helm station also on the bridge. However, that was that there was that control box that was up on the bridge was actually the one from the control room. The helmsman would bring that up to the tower, to or excuse me to the bridge when on maneuvering stations. That it, that means when entering or leaving port. So if you ever see pictures of a of a of a boat entering or leaving port, you'll always see the helmsman up there in the port um, port forward uh, corner of the bridge. He's operating the um, the control box for the um, for the um, for the rudder up there. Okay, so there are, there really there are three, well, actually four helm stations on the boat. We'll cover the, the auxiliary helm and the aft torpedo, or excuse me, um, the aft torpedo room and e motor room later. Uh, in a different video, but <clears throat> suffice it to say, this here is the main helm station for surface travel, uh, and to a certain extent also for submerged travel, unless um, certain battle station situations called for the helmsman being down there, and we covered that a little bit when we were down in the control room, but normally you would find the helmsman sitting up here, hunched hunched over, sitting on his little, um, Wolfpack hasn't modeled it, but there was a, a collapsible seat here that folded down, it was Get, get collapsed up against the bulkhead here. He would fold it down. He would sit on the seat, and he would be these the the control box angled a little more toward where we are now, as was um, his compass uh, gyro compass repeater. And then he would of course have his his engine order telegraphs here. He would have tachometers above those. And to actually supplement this, let's take a look at what this looked like on U ninety six. So here's here's really. Um, kind of the same, I guess we'll get to the same perspective here. That's looking right about here with, with the edge of the ladder there. So you can see just for comparison, um, that's the same view in U96. Again, I, I think Wolfpack's tower is a little bigger than in reality. This is really tiny space up here, but there it's, excuse me, it's pretty close. So up here you see his, te the tachometers up there. 
you've got the voice pipes here, you've got his engine order telegraphs there, you've got a various electrical switches here. He would also have an alarm switch that was covered, similar to what you see in the control room and similar to how Wolfpack has it, an alarm switch that would uh, to trigger the alarm. He would be the guy on, uh, in your typical scenario of like, say, a um, you know an air, aircraft alarm or whatever, he would be your guy that was triggering triggering the alarm. Uh, that was typically his job. If he heard alarm come down from the bridge, he was flipping that switch and then getting ready and ratcheting his EOTs there to to tauchen so that the um, engine room would know that uh, they needed to shut the diesels off, and the e motor room would know to um, to switch the de switch the e motors on. Okay. And so he had that functionality here, and he was typically responsible for that. So you can barely see kind of his his uh, rudder control box there with his push buttons, and then you can see his gyro compass repeater right there. Okay, he'd be huddled in here, and um, he also had something called, and here's actually a different view of it from of U five six four, another Type seven C. This is um, Teddy Zuren's boat. So you remember Teddy Zuren? He was a Famous ace Reinhard Zuren, who was a very very famous ace uh, during the toward maybe toward the middle of the war. But anyway, this is the view from behind the ladder, from between the ladder and the TDC, looking toward the helmsman. This is the combat helmsman. Typically, every every boat had one. He was typically a lot of times the most senior um, senior sailor, senior basic non-raid sailor. Uh, on the boat, and he was the most skilled at the helm, and he was always the helmsman at at battle stations. Okay, so this is the combat combat helmsman here. But again, you see his EOTs up here. Um, you've got his you've got some voice pipes right there, right? And he's he's watching his uh, his gyro compass repeater there. Okay, all right. So that's that's just another view of him, and he's got this this uh, life vest on, which is typical you see in pictures of battle station situations. They'll always have this on. Okay. All right. So another th interesting thing that he had, and here's actually a view of u 995s the way it looks now. There is the collapsible seat that the helmsman would sit on right there. You know, the rest of this is pretty much all gone. I mean, you've got electrical switches here. There's the alarm switch right there. All right. You've got his rudder, rudder control box. And then the other interesting thing to note about these three boxes right here, these two boxes here are actually switches for the, you can see the switches on the top of them. Uh, these are switches for the receiver EOTs. So the receiver units are in, so the, again, just to recap, you've got two sender units, which are in the one in the control room and one set in the control room and one set in the tower because you're sending orders from there. You, you're not receiving them from there. Those are always your sending units. And then you've got two receiving units, Mfenga, two receiving sets of units, and that's one set in the diesel room, and the other set is in the e-motor room. Okay, so what these are these are for is for port and starboard is to set the receiver units to eat which receiver units to be active, either um, just the diesel room, which would be your standard for surface travel. So that means if just the, if this were switched to just the diesel room, every time you change the EOTs up here, the e-motor rooms. Uh, does not does nothing. Their EOTs do nothing, okay? But they don't really need to do anything when you're on the surface. And so the next switch would be both rooms. So this would be diesel diesel room and e-motor room. So it's, again, pretty self-explanatory. Your Both sets of receivers are now functional in both rooms, okay? And then the third one is um, just e-motor room. And so on a dive, in, in a dive situation, the helmsman would set both EOTs to tauchen, that that would signal the diesel room to shut the diesels off and decouple, unclutch the uh, diesel engines from the from the shafts, and then he would switch that to both rooms, and then the e motor room would then respond uh, to uh, to the EOT order. Usually it was great speed ahead for a, like for an alarm type of situation, and then he would once that was done, he would switch these boxes over to e e, um, e motor room only. So then the, the diesel rooms, EOTs would be inactive. They wouldn't show, they wouldn't register changes and the e-motor rooms would, okay? Um, so that's what these are. And then this one here is for uh, switching for the, there's a switch on, I think it's on the side. 
And there's also a dimmer switch here, but the switch on the side is for switching uh, like what rudder control box would be active. So you'd either have the setting would be either tower and bridge or or just tower only. Because again, the control room one is removable. The control room one would go up to the bridge. There, there weren't three of these boxes. There were two. The one in the control room would get removed and brought up to the bridge. Um, <clears throat> and then the dimmer, the switch on the side is actually a dimmer switch for, I believe, for the um, rudder angle indicator, which he, of which one of which he would also have, just like you have in Wolfpack. Right. So that's that's the helmsman station. Uh, the other thing that he had that's interesting, that's not very well known, is he had what's in German what's called an Entfernungsmelder, or alternatively, you hear it sometimes called a Distanzmelder. And what this, what that basically means is, it's like your odometer. It's so the odometer that you have in Wolfpack is actually hi historically accurate. Um, you, this is this was very very handy. It was connected to the log system. Again, the the, the log speed system ran on a very similar uh, system to what you'd have with with your pitot tubes on an airplane. Uh, it worked off of off of um, water flow versus airflow, and it also worked off of ambient pressure. Uh, and so, and that was a that was a way for um, this was connected to that system, and it also had a time element in it, so that it could it could show you just like an like an odometer would how many nautical miles you've traveled in X amount of time. Now it has two things. Uh, I've seen drawings of this looking different on like a 7B. I'm not sure if it looked like this on a 7C or not. They certainly had this, but uh, this is actually from the U505. The, this here is the U505's TDC and actually tucked up over the TDC, not far from the helm station, is is the uh, odometer. Let's just call it the odometer. And so the way this works is you've got two knobs here. You've got um, these are reset knobs. And so the way this works is this top one, abgelaufene, ab, abgelaufene Weg. Abgelaufene Weg means like means your your the the amount of distance you've traveled. Like this is how much this is how far I've gone since I've you know you you could set a preset a preset number of nautical miles and then this would tell you how far you've gone and then based on how you set it rest week would be the rest of the way essentially the here's how much distance you have remaining and so when and this had an this actually had an audible um signal to it where if the rest when the rest week got to zero you know a, a little a little sound would would you'd hear a sound it would, the thing would make a sound and that would be a signal for the helmsman to communicate whether you know what that meant and i guess you can call it waypoints right so what you would have is you'd have the helmsman watching this and he would be presetting it to say okay the navigator might say all right we're going to make a turn you know west in a hundred nautical miles. Okay, and so the helmsman would, would be here, and he would set that in into his device here, and then as these would count down, and as this distance remaining went to zero, his buzzer would go, and then he would say, "Time for a cor it's time for course change," and then that would signal, uh, and he would do execute that. Right, he would call it out, and then he would execute the course change. Okay. So that's that's what that's that's the way this works. This is actually handy, and it's handy because you've got you've it's handy for dead reckoning as well, as the navigator is is you know plodding along between his celestial fixes. He's doing dead reckoning every hour, every few hours, or whatever. He's updating his position position on the chart. Um, he's using this. You know, he's instead of having to do the math, time, speed, distance, he's just reading off the distance traveled here. Very very handy. Okay, very handy. Um, so that's the helm station. That's really all there's probably is to really say about it. Um, so Wolfpack has, and it's entirely for gameplay purposes, they've got the TDC sort of, they, they've got everything kind of shifted this way a little bit. So normally the EOTs would be more here and, you know, other thing like this, the uh, intercom would be a little over here and then the TDC would actually be behind the ladder. Um, it was actually... Here you can see it. If we go back to this picture here, the TDC is behind the ladder. Again, here's another image of the of the helmsman station with, um, with what looks like maybe a petty officer, but maybe the bosun, uh, working the TDC. But here you go again. Uh, you've got 
Um, oh yeah, that's a couple other things I forgot to mention at the helmsman position. You do have these these are dive plane indicators up here. Out of the picture over here is actually um, shallow and deep uh, depth gauges. So there's a there should be a 150 meter depth gauge here, and there's also a Poppenberg uh, water column style one like you'd see in the control room for 25 meters. Um, so those are over there as well. That's also visible to the helmsman. And there's also um, the 7C should also have it. The 7B had it, but the C probably also did as well. Is a um, is a, um, a a water column to show um, listing your listing like listing angle of the of the boat at that particular time. How much it's listing to one side or the other. Okay, but here you see that the TDC is tucked behind the ladder, and up here you see the um, we'll cover this when we cover the fire control system, but the lamp on top of it, so the lamp board for the for all tubes is up there. You can barely see it there. But he's got to sort of tuck himself next to the ladder there in order to operate the computer. I mean, it's really, really literally right behind the ladder. Here's another good image of it right here. Okay. And the one thing I forgot to mention here is if you look closely down here, so the TDC would be right here. That right there is actually the electric firing lever for the tower interior for submerged shooting. It's right next to the TDC. Right? So that's that there. All right. Yeah, so Wolfpack has it a little... They have slid it, everything over here. And I, that's totally understandable. Um, there's really no reason, I guess, to have it behind the ladder. If they did ever want to change it, they could probably do it by, you know you having to access it sort of like the bosun would have had to and do it here and then click on it like this or maybe have some sort of a um, click point you know somewhere in the middle here where you could click it and then it would zoom you through the ladder and you could operate it but I don't know I mean it's fine how it is it's, it's just you know it's if they ever want to change it that's that's how I would do it but um, so that's the so that's the kind of the forward end of the, the forward sort of half of the tower here. Off to the port side, you know, you did have these have holders for Kali Patron. These are your soda lime canisters for your air purification system, the units of which we covered uh, in the bow room video and then in the control room video as well. Uh, there are spots for spares for these all across, all over the boat. Okay, so that's that's what those are there. All right. Also on the bulkheads here, you had... Um, in various places, you know, there were there were places to keep like sheaths to keep um, charts in. There were holders for stopwatches for various re purposes for the navigator, uh, etc. Because um, remember, the navigator was his battle station was at, for submerged fire, and his battle station was also up here in the tower. You've got the commander at the scope. You've got the the navigator standing here helping him. The bosun is here by the ladder operating the TDC and then the helmsman is here so you've got you literally have four people in this tower for a submerged firing situation it's incredibly cramped and it blows boggles the mind how um, how they made that work but at any rate uh, so there were various other little things here uh, on the walls that were interesting on the bulkheads that were interesting okay um, you've got down here the <clears throat> This is the hydraulic motor. So again, to recap on this one, um, the boat has two hydraulic motors, and they are des they're designed to operate the periscopes, the raising and lowering of the observation scope, and then the raising and lowering of the attack scope, as well as the slewing of the attack scope. Okay. Um, later on, when snorkel was implemented, the hydraulic system also powered the snorkel. Um, but here you can see that this here, this big cylindrical thing here down down here is the hydraulic motor for raising and lowering the, per the attack periscope. The Similar to what we saw above the chart table in the control room for the observation scope, this is for the attack scope, and that is the socket for, or excuse me, the male end to insert a socket, like a ratchet over it, to, to manually raise and and lower the per the attack periscope if the hydraulic motor went out. Okay, so that's what that is. Um, and then, as far as the actual periscope itself, this, so in German, this is called the Stanzirohr, Stanzirohr, C2 Stanzirohr. This was a, a incredibly innovative piece of gear, something that the Germans kept, well, 
until a huge 570 was captured in 1941, and then the British had had one. Um, they kept this top, top, top secret. I mean, you very. That's why in, in newsreels you see, um, you'll you'll see skippers operating the observation periscope, and they say, you know, you see a newsreel, and it says, oh, you know, your German U-boat's on the attack or whatever, and the, the skipper lines up a shot, and he's always at the observation periscope. It's because a, they're keeping this technology here, the attack periscope, super secret, and B, there's just not a lot of room for a cameraman up here <laughs> in the tower. It's that tight. Um, the In Wolfpack, you can't, by default, you don't see, and I don't have anybody else in, with me in game to have them turn around to see the front side of it, but you don't, you don't by default, don't see the front side of the, of the periscope, but if we look at what the thing looked like, um, you know, they've done a reasonably good job of, of modeling it. Um, this is what the skipper would see if he were sitting at the periscope. He's got a control for, um, he's got his ocular here. He's got a control here for his magnification one and a half uh, times or six times. He's got a lever here for his t his um, his ability to, to tilt it up or down. It would go up, I want to say, maybe 20 degrees up and maybe 10 or 15 degrees down, not as high as the observations. The observations would go up 90 degrees. Uh, not so for the attack periscope. And then down here, so if you remember what this lever looks looks like here, down here further, you'd have one for raising and lowering. And, and therein lies the main advantage of this periscope over others. Um, in fact, when the Americans actually got, got to take a look at U-570, uh, when they sent people over to take a look at it, when it was in British hands, they said, they called. They literally called this the C2 Stanzigua the answer to an attack officer's prayers. This is versus what the Americans had in the Gato and Baleo class boats, which was your standard type periscope, that, like the observation scope, where you say you know you have to raise it and lower it, and you can maybe incrementally raise it and lower it. But it's the skipper himself doesn't have the control over the over the height of the scope. He has to order somebody else to do that. With the Stanzigrohr, that's completely different. The operator stays in at one level. He stays seated on his little s saddle, and he simply reaches down with his left hand, pulls it, pulls the lever up if he wants to raise the head of the scope up, and pushes it down if he wants to lower it. He has he's not relying on anybody else to operate the periscope for him, All right? So that's a huge advantage because again, tactically, what you're doing when you're approaching ships is you're trying to keep that head of that periscope like the size of a fist just at the waterline almost always underwater almost always being washed over by waves and this makes that possible because you'd have your hand on that lever all the time and it's just going up and down up and down up and down um this gauge up here is actually how high the periscope the head of the periscope is at this at that moment okay and then right here so wolfpack you have the you have the true bearing indicator. Whoops, excuse me. You have the true bearing indicator at the bottom, and you did indeed have that actually in the in the on the Stanze. Well, you had um, you had the this here is actually the counter for true bearing, and so you had connection to the um, to the gyro compass, and you could see in I want to say this is down to the to a third of a degree accuracy. The true bearing that you're looking at. So this, this was connected to the to the gyro compass system, and then this says Richtknopf für Zählwerk. So Richtknopf für Zählwerk is um, uh, that's your your uh, your adjustment knob to realign the counter Zählwerk uh, counter with the uh, with the gyro compass. That's what that is right there. Okay. And so uh, to synchronize it, resynchronize it. Okay, so that's that's what that is. So this is what he'd be seeing right here if he had his eye away from the ocular, All right? But again, you've it's historically it wasn't visible in the ocular itself, but it indeed was on the scope. So what was visible through the ocular? Uh, the way I didn't show the entire thing because Wolfpack actually has it accurate. Um, this one sixteenth scale is it's the same thing that was in the observation scope. Um, Again, the, the vertical marks are 10 sixteenths of a degree. And then the, the horizontal marks here are at the bottom are um, degrees. At the top, you had, and you might be saying, okay, well, what is, what is, why are there two? 
And there are two because one is the projection of relative bearing. So just like in Wolfpack, you would see the relative bearing being projected in your in your view by way of prisms. And the one above it is actually from what's in German what's called the Vorheitschieber. Vorheitschieber is your lead angle ring. So all of these periscopes had, go back to this, both of the scopes had, and I covered this I think in the in the control room when I covered the observation scope, but you can see, do you see these this knob right here and this knob right here? You can push and you can see that there's a guide there. You can see that even how it, it ends right here, but it goes all around. It'll go 60 degrees to each side. So that's a way, and, and I, I think I covered this in the control room, but that's a way for you to preset a lead angle for reference when you're firing without the aid of the TDC when you're firing what's with what in German is called with a fest with festem Schusswinkel, which is with a fixed gyro angle. So you'd be setting, and we can cover that. We'll cover that when we cover the fire control system in detail, how that would have been possible, but uh, or how that would have been done. But basically, you know, you're comp you're pre-computing the lead angle, and you can use the TDC for that, or you can use tables or slide rules, uh, and you are and you're basically setting the you're setting the Shiba to the gyro angle, and then you're setting your you're setting it also to the uh, to the lead angle that you want. And when you look through the scope, you see the lead angle, and that zero mark will be on the reference bearing that you need to go to in order to fire. So you're really it's showing you what your shoot bearing is, saying okay, I've got my shot set up. And I, I know my lead angle is 10 degrees, so this would be sitting on like either 10 or 350, depending on what side the target is. And then that would allow the operator to say, ah, there's my reference line, that's my shoot bearing that I preset on my rings. Okay, so that's for firing without the aid of the TDC. Um, so another kind of little known thing about both periscopes indeed have that. You know, when you see in Dust Boat, people, you know, people tend to take what they see in Dust Boat as like holy writs, and you got to be careful with that. Um, they did a great job, but a lot of technical details just aren't quite right. You see the, the, the skipper, like, looking up at his relative bearing, and he did have a pointer right here, you could see it there. Looking up and trying to see it, there's really no, he didn't need to do that. I mean, you can see that through the through the ocular. It's projected for him in there, okay? So that's that. Um, I mentioned there's a hydraulic motor for raising and lowering, which we actually looked at already. We looked at that, we looked at that here. So on the scope itself, there's also one, and it's actually right there. You can see it sticking out. That's Wolfpack's model make of it right there, but that is the hydraulic motor for, um, whoops, actually here. This right here is the hydraulic motor for turning. This here is the line for oil, for your hydraulic fluid to come in and, uh, and drive the motor. Uh, but that's the motor for turning right there. This hand wheel here is for manual turning. If the, if you, if you don't want to steer with the pedals again because this is steered with foot pedals and it's you push the right foot pedal down and you go left and you push the left foot pedal down and you need to go clockwise you go right so that's how that works but if you didn't want to use that you would use the, the motor here this here is the it's on the back again you can see it's on the back side of the periscope so this is your um your bearing transmitter for the attack periscope remember there was one on the overhead like in the ceiling essentially of the control room for the observation scope this is the one for the attack periscope and then you've also got one the UZO had one in the UZO column itself so UZO one was actually inside of this inside of this column at the top was the was the GABA the transmitter for the for the UZO and firing uh, from the bridge all right so so that's the that's the Stanzero, a great piece of equipment, super super helpful. Um, the Germans tried to keep it tight wraps on it, but again in 1941, um, when the British got their hands on U-570, it was no longer a secret. Uh, but they were completely amazed by it, totally blown away. Um, huge huge advantage for the Germans. 
Uh, the last thing I'll mention about this uh, aft end of the tower here is this none of this piping would have been here. What you had around starting from right about here all the way around the tower, back aft side of the tower, you actually had wood paneling. There's wood paneling there, and that's because, you know, if the skipper had some sort of coat on or was had a little thicker build to him or he had some thicker clothing on, it's so his back could slide along the back side of the tower there. So you had wood paneling back there. You did not have these pipes that you'd be getting all bump, bumping up against them if that were the way it was in reality. All right. So that's really the back side. Of, that's the, the after sort of side of the tower. And I think that's really all I'm going to cover in terms of, of equipment um, besides the TDC. We'll get to that next. But I guess just a little funny anecdote about the tower really. Uh, some, so I mentioned smoking, I think I mentioned, I may or may not have mentioned smoking. Well, if I haven't yet, I'll cover it when we go to the bridge, but, uh, um, I'll sort of touch on it now, I guess, cause there's a little funny, funny story with this, uh, with the tower and with the attack periscope with regard to smoking. So it was up to the skipper to, to as to how many people that were allowed on the bridge at one point in time and where people could smoke. You could not smoke inside the, inside the submarine itself because of um well really for two reasons right you've got you've got your um you've got your your diesel engines which are again a diesel isn't super combustible but regardless you've got you've got a closed space that is ventilated yes but again it's a closed space an enclosed space that's got diesel fuel and it also has battery gases both produced both from uh, your G7E torpedo batteries, as well as the huge batteries in the to power the submarine itself, the, to power the submarine underwater itself. So the batteries are giving off <coughs> hydrogen. That is the primary reason why smoking is not allowed in the boat. The Americans allowed smoking um, ad nauseum in their submarines. The Germans absolutely not. The one exception to that is in the tower interior. Sometimes skippers would let their guys like one guy or two guys at a time actually sit up here by the attack periscope across from the helmsman here and smoke cigarettes um one or two guys and and there'd be like a line down here in the control room so, sort of like how there was a line for the for the head to use the head you'd have the similar line here for you know and, and the guys looking up and like you'll hear sometimes veterans will describe like you know a guy knows how long it takes to smoke a cigarette and so he'll be up there like, all right, come on. I'll, I know how long you've been up there. Like you're done now. You know, come on, come on, come on, come on. Suck it down or whatever. But the, so like U96, for example, had Willenbrock, the skipper, allowed his guys to smoke in the tower. One or two guys. <laughs> and the um, the anecdote from from Buchheim is in his, in the, the he wrote a book called Jäger im Weltmeer, which is um, his, it's like Das Boot Light. It's like his his recount, his propaganda piece about his his time on U ninety six, like right after he got back, uh, or at least written during the war, and he 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 said that, that the crew do, uh, dubbed because they're sitting by the attack periscope when they're smoking, um, on the Dorflinde, on the Dorflinde, which is like which is like at it's like at the village um, like at the village tree is is basically what it is. It's um, Linden tree at the village. Linden tree is really what that is. Um, just funny, like you know that what they would do is is come up here and smoke, and then it's like eh, they're smoking on the <laughs> by the village, you know, by the village linden tree here. That's what that is. And so, um, so that that was just a little, I guess, a little, um, you know, um, a funny anecdote about what you know what, how guys could smoke in the boat, and if they if they couldn't smoke in the actual boat proper down there, they'd smoke in the tower at the skipper's uh, permission. So otherwise it was up on the bridge. All right. All right. So that's tower. Uh, we covered who stood battle stations here again. I'll, I'll cover quickly again. The, the, so the, the commander would be up here at the periscope for a submerged attack. He'd be up here at the periscope up here with him would be the navigator to help him with tables or slide rules or, or a stopwatch or whatever he needs. Um, the bosun, so the Zeemannische Nummer 1, this would be the your your chief bosun, so to speak, just like in Dust Boat, was up here operating the computer. Now, I think for submerged attack, they've got the first watch officer up here operating the TZ. 
not not typically the case. The boson was up here. That was his battle station, regardless of submerged or surfaced. Okay. Um, boson at the TDC, navigator, commander, and then you got the helmsman, the combat helmsman up here as well. Very very cramped space for a for a surface attack. You know, commander's up on the bridge. First watch officer is up there as well. You're, it's really just your those two guys now. You've got your helmsman and your TDC operator down here. So very different for a sub surface attack. All right. Okay. So that being said, I think I covered all my pictures here. Oh, the one thing I didn't cover here is so what? It, so we all know the TDC as it looks um, in maybe or maybe we don't. I guess so let's just take a look at this. So Wolfpack has has modeled just to a certain extent the model S3. Okay, and this was the model that was the most prevalent during the war. It took different shapes depending on the type of boat that was installed in. This is the shape for the Type 7 uh, C. Uh, the Type 9 had one that was more vertically oriented, uh, but it had all the same functionality. Type 10 had had no forward tubes, and so that one had was a little different. The Type 21 actually even got the same computer. It looked more like the Type 9s, but... The Germans once they once they made the S3, the Germans really didn't change the fire control system appreciably uh, after that. Okay, so this is what people are tend to be familiar with. It's what they see in Dust Boat. It's what they see in sometimes in mods like in U-boat mod. It's what's there, and it's also sort of what's in Wolfpack. Okay, but what did it look like before before the S3? Now the S3 came around in about this, the development of the S3 started in about 1937, and it was start it started being delivered to boats. Um, for testing in 1939 and then in earnest in 1940. Uh, so, and it was designed as part of the as part of the new 7C fire control system. 7A and 7B were delivered a different fire control system that had a lot of the same components, but just in a more simplified fashion and in, and not in a streamlined fashion. And like what that looked like, for example, for on a typical type 7B would be the type would was the Tevorhaltrechner C37. So this is your typical 7B fire con or, uh, TDC. Uh, the one for the 7A looked substantially similar to this. It had just a few few differences. Okay, this one had a few improvements over that, but very very few. Uh, this one was it was more point and shoot. You had connectivity. The uh, the system had connectivity with the optics, just like the uh, the S3 system had. However it had no functionality for Lage laufen, which means that the the angle on bow didn't update as you turn the periscope, as it did in the S3, which is the functionality that people are typically familiar with from games like SH3 or SH5 U-boat, uh, where you know you know you have that that direct coupling really with AOB and bearing. Not so on this computer. Um, also, the parallax calculation had to be done by hand, and that was basically by way of matching pointers. So that was actually pretty laborious, and, and I read that it actually took really two guys to operate this computer because you had to have one guy entering the settings for that are given by the commander for target speed and for angle on bow, etc. And then the guy who a, a guy that needs to keep updating the parallax calculation every time the gyro angle changes and every time the range changes and the bearing changes uh, because parallax is going to be constantly changing. So this this computer was actually more designed for um, or was more, it lent itself more to point to s setting up a static shot in the future and then waiting until the target crossed your fire, your, crossed the wire, crossed your aiming point, and then you would fire. Um, whereas the S3, and we'll cover that next, was a significant improvement, especially with regard to convoy attacks because it allowed for easy shifting of fire with that you know again this also had direct connectivity with the optics but with the s3 now you had the computer updating the angle on bow of the target for every degree of bearing change and every degree of course change huge advantage basically the way wolfpack has the tdc now um they have the that that functionality for lage laufend already see i'm changing the bearing I don't know why this is target heading. That's not target heading. Um, I'm changing the bearing and the AOB angle on bow is changing. That's log and open. Okay, that's that's AOB continuous is what that means. It's constantly updating. 
as the bearing changes. The other older versions of the computer didn't have that functionality. All right. Okay, so I will walk through. I'm not going to walk through how to operate T, um, Wolfpack's TDC. I will walk through how to operate the real TDC, and I'll, I, I will walk through an example of um, from MDB, so Marina Dienstvorschrift 416, uh, booklet three is actually the operation of the of the. Um, it's actually the uh, um, uh, the like instructions for conducting a torpedo attack with the fire control system is really what it is all right so i and i'll actually be kind of running through the boat to show you kind of how the different components are operated for a, basically like a full simulated attack and we'll use an example for um we'll use an example of we'll, we'll, we'll assume the boat is going to be firing while turning and it's going to be firing underwater so the, the skipper is going to be at the attack periscope so the first thing we have to do um when battle stations are ordered, we'll forget about what the torpedo men have to do with the torpedo tubes, but we'll focus strictly on the fire control system. So battle stations are ordered. Um, the, the first thing that has to be done is in the forward torpedo room, you would have a seaman up at the forward gyro angle receiver, which we covered here. The seaman would be here, and what he would have to do is he would have to make sure, and he'd be looking at his gyro angle receiver, um, and he would be looking at this and making sure that the gyro angle pointers here are, and so there's two pointers, there's an inner pointer and there's an outer pointer. You can barely see the outer pointer, it's sort of like a rectangular shape. The outer pointer is what's currently set in the torpedoes, and the inner pointer is what's being transmitted from the TDC. So he's paying attention to the outer pointers, and he's and he's he sets this switch here to the bottom setting, which is gyro angle by hand. Schussfinkel von Hand. He sets the switch to the bottom position. He can use the wheel to turn the outer pointers to zero, and then there's actually a window on the torpedo tubes for you to be able to see what the gyro angle is that's currently set in the um, in the torpedo. There's a you can see that actually there's a a little ring like a, with gradations on it that has shows what the actual gyro angle is that's set in the gyroscope and that needs to be zero as well all right so um so you would basically turn the wheel until until you're you're reading zero here that's really the first step um and then you would return this switch the default setting for this switch is actually the top one which is streuwinkel von hand schusswinkel automatisch that means spread angle by hand gyro angle automatic that was the that was the the default setting for this gyro angle receiver because the gyro angle is going to be electrically transmitted from the tdc and shown on the inner pointers here uh and there's a there's actually a um an amplifying motor that's in this that's on the back side of this device that that sync that works to synchronize those pointers okay that works to synchronize those pointers and thereby turn the gyro spindles that are that come out of the back side of this device and set the gyro angles automatically in the torpedoes okay so that's that's that so you would you would do that there and then your your torpedo man in the aft torpedo room which will run oops, run into the wall um the aft torpedo room if you run back there real quickly here he'd be doing the same thing so you'd have you'd have one guy back here as well You have one guy back here as well at the aft gyro angle receiver. Now you can see they actually have the pointers modeled. The outer pointers with the little triangles are what is actually set in the torpedo, and the inner pointer um, is what's being transmitted. Now, the aft gyro angle receiver is not automatic. It is strictly match the pointer, an exercise in matching the pointers. The aft gyro angle receiver is an exercise in matching the pointers. You have the, here it is, the inner pointer shows the gyro angle. The operator is um, is um, relied on to turn the, turn the hand crank until the outer pointer matches the inner pointer, and he's thereby turning the gyro spindles and doing so and setting them to the correct gyro angle. So that's, 
that's the next, that's what this guy back here is doing. He's setting, he's making sure the gyro angle is set to zero as well. All right. So that's, that's been done. Now we need to actually turn the system on. So how does that work? If we go up to the control room again. Now again, this is this device isn't modeled in Wolfpack, but right here you would see the main switch box for the fire control system. And that is this. You'll see it's actually a pretty prominent device. You see it in if you see an image of the chart table, you almost always see this. It's a relatively large excuse me, a relatively large box and it's angled overlooking the chart table. So what does this do? So a couple things here. You've got a couple switches down here, uh, and then you've got a cycle switch here, and then a select a couple selector switches, and then you've got a regulating knob here. So what you what's what's happening here is you're turning both of these switches on. These switches, this one provides 110 volt DC power to power to to power the um, launch torpedo launching system, which is which is um, three things. That's your fire, your electric firing levers and the tower and the, br and the bridge. That's the lamp boards that show your um, what tubes have been selected, and that's also your um, your control box, your firing control box, which is actually this one right here. If you see what I'm circling, okay, under the chart table. That's what's turning. That's that's those run on 110 volt uh, DC. This switch here provides. This says GV. That that is um, that is that stands for Generator Verstärker, and that is that's for the um, uh, that's for the gyro setting gear. Okay, that is the um, that's the the amplifier for the gyro setting gear to give it enough power to be able to, to turn the gyro spindles and set the gyro the gyro angle of the torpedoes. This switch will pro will, will will power um, that that device 110 volt to that. Now we come up here and we. This switch is currently in the bottom position. That that says Umforma. UMF is Umforma. There is a there is a fire control system um, converter in the aft torpedo room that converts that takes 110 volt current and tr and turns it into 55 volt AC. It takes 110 volt DC and converts it to 55 volt AC in order because the fire control system runs on 55 volt AC. You can see that here, okay? So that's what the converter does in the aft torpedo room. Uh, in the aft torpedo room is also the GV. That's the uh, the gyro setting amplifier. That's also there. The bottom switch is both of those things are off. I have to select the left-hand side. And that says Umforma Anlauf GV Aus. That means the the I want to um, I'm gonna, I want to start the converter for for the fire control system. And my um, GV uh, amplifier is still off. Next, I cycle it to the top position. That's Umforma Betrieb. That means my my fire control converter is running. And G and Gefall Anlauf, which is GV start. So now I st this gives me uh, that's now um, starting the starter the starter mode, activating the starter motor to start the GV. The GV will run off of 110 volt, but the starter motor, that's what's ha happening there. You're, you're activating the starting motor for that that will fire up the gyro setting gear. And then as a last step, you set it to the right. This is the default setting. This is for both are running. Betrieb. Okay, both say Betrieb, so that means they're both running. Okay, good. So that means now we actually we should have 55 volt registering here on the gauge. You, can, you might actually even be able to see it, or maybe not, but right at 55 volts there there's a red line that's the that tells the operator okay you know i've got i'm you know if my needle is at that red line 55 volts is what i need right and so um you've got okay so and then you've got the knob here which spannung spannungsregler which is your um uh, your voltage regulator you're you're able to if this is not 55 volts or it's you know it's alternating you can use this knob to regulate it to make sure it's at 55 volts okay and now the fire control system is getting the power it needs if you then select the right hand switch here so tr trw anl that's torpedo richtungsweise anlage that's your fire control system 
alternatively, alternatively called the Feuerleit Anlage. But that TRW Anlage is your torpedo direct. Well, that's not correct. It's torpedo director system because your fire control system is made up of your torpedo director system and your torpedo launching system. Okay, the launching system of which we turn on down here. TRW, TRV, um, so Torpedo Richtungsweise Anlage is the Torpedo Director System. That's your your TDC, that's your uh, your your um, bearing transmitters, uh, etc. That's what that is. Different, and then there's the Torpedo Launching System. All of that collectively is known as the Feuerleit Anlage or the Fire Control System. Okay, so if I've got 55 volts regulating or um, registering here, I switch this to the right, and that provides power to the fire control system. Or I switch it to the left, and that SW, that's Scheinwerferanlage. So the the searchlight system was actually powered by the same converter, fire, the fire control converter, for to provide it with 55 volt AC. It's funny how you wouldn't assume that. And when I first looked at this, I was like, what the heck? Why would this be? It's because they, if you look at schematics, it's because the the um, the searchlight system is run off of the same um, power source. All right, so that so that's turning the system on. Um, we then go under the chart table, and you can see in Wolfpack, I think they've, yeah, they've got a model here. We now go to these boxes here. The one on the left is your torpedo director switch box, because again, remember, there's two elements of the fire control system, torpedo director switch box, and then the torpedo launch switch box on the right. Um, and so what we need to do, and I'll use again to supplement, we want to switch these. So this one here is is the on the on the Wolfpack TDC. You have a lot of these switches are actually on the TDC itself in Wolfpack for ease of use. Uh, they could probably make these real boxes and have somebody in the control room actually control them. It wouldn't be that big of a deal, I guess. But Zielrichtung. So so the Zielrichtung one is your bearing one. That is that is the angle tracking switch, effectively. That's basically what it is. It's your angle tracking for your um, your bearing tracking for the optics. Um, although there's an, there's actually an intermediary step to actually get the, the bearing to, to 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 be synchronized, but we'll cover that later. But these are so the one on the top is for the bridge for the for the it says Ziel Optik. That's your Ziel Optik is your um, UZO, and then you've got one down here for each of the uh, bearing transmitters at the periscopes. So that's where you want that. You want to set this to anything but off because you want to be able to test your fire control system and to make sure that the bearing is being transmitted. All right. So that's that. The the one on the right Schussrichtung Schussrichtung is your the direction of fire. So this designates which gyro angle receiver you want to be active either the bow room or the stern room okay so that's that um so we want to we're good on those we want to we want to test the transmission and then we want to make sure the gyro angle receiver that we want is selected okay all right um so now we're going to actually go up to we'll go back up to the tdc and i'll again i will um I'll use the TDC image that I have of the real one to kind of supplement this. But you'd go here, you go, you come to the TDC, this next step, and say, all right, got my TDC in front of me. Um, down to the to the to the right of it, right about here, would be the actual on switch for the TDC itself. All right, so once you flick that switch, then you are you should see the dials light up. And you'd hear a hum. You'd hear the, uh, to the extent any of the synchro motors were on, you would hear the humming of those. Okay. Uh, so you would, um, you would, oops, excuse me. You would, um, you make sure all everything was lit up, and then you would take a look at your lamp board, which I, and I, I mentioned the lamp board earlier. You should see any number of these be lit based on what's selected on. In the in the torpedo launch switch box, okay. You want to make sure that these are lit. Some of these are lit because then you know that your torpedo firing system is working properly. All right. Um, and so, at that point in time, what you would do is you would test the the motors. And we're not gonna 
go through exactly how to test it, I guess. We'll just, I'll just sort of explain what the motors are and what they do. So you've got several, so the, the, the TDC S3 had several, what, what I like, what called sort of synchro motors in them. Way, they were motors in there that most of these point, most of these dials had an outer pointer and an inner pointer. They were, some of them were receiving information and then the synchro motor was responsible for aligning the computer's internals, like say the bearing that's actually in the computer with whatever is being transmitted. Okay, that's bearing tracking or angle tracking. That's how that works. But in order to make that happen, you actually have to turn on the synchro motor to make that happen. So there are several switches on there, on here. Uh, on the bottom, there are three, and you can see those here. You've got one. The one on the left is for angle on bow. That's the angle on bow motor. That is your motor for Lagerlaufend. That's the motor to allow the angle on bow to, to adjust for every degree of bearing change and or course change. The one, this one here is the motor for spread angle. And this one here is actually the is actually not a motor. It's a magnetic coupling for angle on bow. It is actually what provides the computer with connectivity to the gyro compass because the computer did indeed have connectivity with the gyro compass because it um, it took own course changes into account. So this was actually a magnetic coupling that uh, once it was activated, once the switch was on, it then it activated that. It provided power to that magnetic coupling, and then closed the cir the um, closed the connection to the gyro compass. Effectively, is what's happening there. This here is a dimmer switch. That's the dimmer switch for the for your your dials. Okay, so that's that. That's the motor switches down there. And then on the top, you also had two. These would be up here at the top right hand corner. These two switches up here. Up there, you've got the you got switch for bearing. For the bearing motor, switch for the bearing motor, and then switch for the parallax motor. So there's so the S3 had this was the big advantage. One of the big advantages of the S3 over the previous TDC models is now we've got a parallax motor. We've got a way for the computer to solve the implicit equation that is parallax, and we'll go through what I mean by that later. But you've got now a way to automatically solve for that solve that implicit equation and it's doing it by way of this um, the parallax motor okay so those are your switches so you would go through and you would actually turn each one of those switches on and you would perform some tests on the computer to make sure all of those components were working properly um, you, you know and and so as you're you know as you're doing that you're watching the gauges you're making sure everything is working right uh, and once you once it looks like everything is working correctly you Keep all your switches on except for this bottom left switch here. That's the motor for Lagerlaufend. You switch that off. Here is where we diverge from the from the current understanding of this computer. Um, so based on the documents I have, I have the original documents for this in terms of the operation of this computer and the schematics of how it works. Um, TBRE.org is an outstanding site. I recommend it to everybody. It is 98, 99, 98 to 99% all there and correct. The few mistakes it makes, one of which is this switch here, uh, and then a couple other minor things, but maybe the biggest one is this, this switch here. So this is actually not how you turn on AOB tracking. It is actually how you turn off AOB tracking so that you can update the angle on bow. This knob down here is the angle on bow input, and if the bearing motor, if, excuse me, if the AOB motor is on, you can't turn this knob without the bearing, or excuse me, without the AOB resynchronizing again. You need to have a way to turn that off. So if you need, that's why this says here in German, it says drücken bei Lagenwinkelhandeinstellung. Drücken bei Lagenwinkelhandeinstellung means press it when setting AOB by hand. And if you look at the documentation for this in the schematics, this is the Abschalter, Abschalter für Lagerlaufend. Abschalter means the cutoff switch. It's the cutoff. It's not the on switch, it's the off switch. And it's actually spring-loaded. If you look at a, the, uh, another picture of the back side of this cover removed, there's a spring there. It's a spring-loaded button. It's just, it works just like a button. You, you basically press it. It What it does is it actually deactivates this magnetic coupling for AOB. 
effectively what it's doing is it's de it's it's um, decoupling the computer's connectivity with the gyro compass, and it's allowing um, it's allowing you to update AOB because nothing is triggering the AOB motor anymore. It does it by way of this pointer here. The inner pointer here represents your course. It does not mean that this is pointing to 10 degrees or zero degrees or whatever. It's your relative course changes. It will, this will turn right as your as your gyro compass. Oops. This gauge will this pointer will start turning to the right if your boat turns right, and it'll start turning to the left if your boat turns left. Um, the outer pointer here is the sum of bearing and angle on bow combination. And the deviation in these pointers is actually how the AOB motor knows, in, our, in other words, how Lage Laufen functionality knows to update the, the angle on bow. Um, when you push this cutoff switch, it resynchronizes these pointers. So there is no more error signal to the AOB motor to update anything. And as you turn this knob, both of these pointers would then turn the bearing pointer and AOB pointer would bring the inner pointer along with it. The, both the pointers stay aligned. No error signal is triggering to communicate to the AOB motor to update it. Okay, that's what this does. It doesn't turn uh, AOB tracking on. It actually turns it off. How you turn it on is you simply just turn the AOB motor on. And so that's how that's how this AOB tracking works. This is the this is the important dial with respect to AOB tracking because, again, the inner pointer represents your um, relative course changes, and the outer pointer is the sum of bearing and, and AOB. To the extent that pointer changes and this pointer changes and you've got AOB motor on, that's going to send an error signal. It's going to close some contacts in there. It's going to send an error signal to the AOB motor to realign those pointers and thereby move the AOB okay so one misconception completely out of the way that's not what this is doing it's not turning AOB tracking on it's turning it off how you turn it on is you turn the motor on for okay so very little known but just that's whoever makes the most re whoever makes the next realistic TDC we got to get that right and that's very it's a very important thing and it was a big oversight by tdre.org I'm not, that's not to disparage him. He's unfortunately passed away in 2017, and I just, I don't think he had all the documentation at the point in time when he passed to know, uh, to um, complete the circle with regard to this, okay? So, um, okay, so that, that being said, let's say we're good to go. We've got a fully functional fire control system, and we're ready to, ready to rock. All right, so the... Let's just say the attack begins, okay? The the commander has ordered a four-shot fan with the TDC, and he's ordered to switch to the attack scope. All right, so what we would do is the operator of the um, switch boxes down here would come here, and he would say, all right, it's a four-shot fan, it's with TDC, and it's going to be from the attack periscope. So he would actually select, here's the attack periscope here, he'd select this switch to that. He knows that it's going to be a fan shot, so he knows it's going to be from the bow room, so he would select bow torpedo room here. Now he'd go to his launching switch box, and then he would say, okay, I need to set this to the to this Fächer im Drehen, that's his fan uh, while shooting, I need. I know I want a fan, so I'd set that there. It's a four-shot fan, which means I want to set all one, one, three, two, and four. So that's actually this setting here. So I'd click that to there, and then I know we're firing from the tower interior. That's the bottom setting. The top setting is fire is to activate the firing switch for the bridge. That's on the UZO column. The one pointing down is the one inside the tower. Okay. All right, so that's all set up. We've got all those switches set correctly. We come back up into the tower. The man at the TDC would then be switching the parallax knob to the correct um, to the correct setting. Now they've used this as the parallax knob as a proxy for torpedo depth. There was no torpedo depth setting on the TDC. Uh, the parallax knob is this here, and what it's doing is it's telling the computer 
to use the correct Cartesian coordinates for to compute parallax from the correct end of the boat. It's either it, the settings are either Vorderrohre or Achterrohre, so either forward tubes or after tubes. It's telling the computer what um, coordinates to effectively coordinates to use to compute parallax correctly. Okay, um, so that so that's important. And now we go back down to the bow room. Let's just pretend we're running down to the bow room again, and we're going to our gyro angle receiver. And now, I because a four-shot fan has been ordered, the first step I have to do here is I have to make sure I turn the wheel until the outer pointer of the spread angle dial is at zero. Very, very important. Because if it's not, and I select a fan, if this doesn't start at zero the uh the ratios that get introduced into the into the into the uh uh gyroscopes by way of the gyro spindles is going to be wrong my starting point if my starting point is wrong and so the that's why this sign right here says um you, you don't you only set a fan when the outer pointer of the spread angle dial is on zero so i would take i would turn this until the outer pointer said zero of my spread angle dial and then I would switch this down to four shot fan. Fira fecha. Okay, because I know that's what's gonna be that's what's going to be um, used. Okay. And if this is at zero, then what happens is every time I turn this wheel to set the spread angle to match the pointer, it will introduce the correct ratios into the into the torpedoes. Okay. Okay. Um, and again, like I said, this needs to be um, set to um, to the top setting. Steuerwinkel von Handschusswinkel automatisch. I would also reach over here to the right side of the device and flick on the, the, the on switch for the motor so that you would then see power in this device and then the synchro motors would be active. Okay. Um, and what that's doing is basically then for every movement of the inner pointer of the, of the gyro angle dials it will then automatically move the outer pointers to align to follow them and they won't there'll be a little bit of a lag it's not instantaneous right but that as long as the inner pointer is uh, the outer pointer is following the inner pointer then the gyro spindles are setting the correct gyro uh, angles in the torpedoes okay um, if for example the operator like slewed the uh, the operator at the optics slewed the bearing super fast over to one direction this can only turn and synchronize so fast so that's why he has this Schnellgang switch here if that if these pointers get out of line by a certain number of degrees um, I can't remember if it's like three degrees or five degrees or might be two and a half or whatever one of these lights will light up and it'll like if it's if it's if he slews super far to the left and you know the bearing or the gyro angle is not catching up fast enough he can flick the switch to the left and it will actually kick in an additional speed motor in order to more quickly resynchronize those uh, pointers okay until they're and then so when he sees the light go off then he would release the switch this is just for quickly re quickly uh, helping the pointers to catch up to the inner pointer the outer pointer to catch up to the inner pointer so that there wasn't any time wasted in having uh, the correct gyro angle set in the torpedoes. Because remember, at, at the computer, the, the operator had a light on it, a white light that was the Deckungslampe, and as soon as that lamp lit up, it meant that the, that the, um, that the settings in the torpedoes were within like two and a half degrees of, of what the um, inner pointer said. And then they could shoot, uh, because by the time they actually pulled the trigger, those pointers would be aligned, okay? But this switch here was a way to accelerate that if, for instance, you know, whoever was at the optics decided to just slew all the way around to one direction. All right, so that's what that is. Um, so we've got all of our settings are correct on the gyro angle receiver now. Um, we would also see this light be blue if the... Um, if the the follow-ups the follow switch on the TDC which we'll cover is set to is set to not follow or blue don't follow okay this is a way as a check lamp for the operator here to know whether or not um, his pointers would be um, 
his inner pointers would be moving because if this is if this blue light is on, that means the TDC is no longer tracking the bearing uh, of the optics, and therefore these pointers won't move because it's, these pointers will move when bearing moves when bearing changes. Okay, so that's a check light. When this light goes on, he he knows that there's nothing for him to worry about in terms of um, of paying attention to the alignment of these pointers. Okay. So that's that's what that is. Um, okay, so gyro angle receiver is set. We're good. For, so bow room is set. The torpedoes are set in the bow room. Yeah, the torpedoes are set in the stern room. Uh, the aft torpedo is set there. So we're ready to to operate the TDC now. Now come now comes the in German what they call the um, Feuerleitansprache, which is the, uh, the your sort of litany of fire control orders to the TDC. They have to be in a certain order, and it's because of the way the TDC functions. You can't rattle the data off in any old order. It has to be in a certain order. So the first order that would come is depth. So let's say depth 4. Now there is no setting for um, depth on the TDC. That is set. I covered this in the bow room video. That's actually set by way of a knob on the torpedo tubes that would introduce a spindle down into the torpedo to to set the, the the depth of the torpedo, okay? So the depth would come first. Next comes tor next comes um, torpedo speed. Now, why torpedo speed? It's because the way that the way the TDC works with regard to the lead angle is it's it's what it's doing is it's computing your lead angle, and from that lead angle, it's taking it's taking um, lead angle and bearing and range. And computing parallax and gyro angle, and it's and it's and it's 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 computing gyro angle because it's the ultimate goal of the TDC is to transmit that gyro angle to the forward gyro angle receiver and the aft gyro angle receiver. Okay, but it has to compute lead angle first, and in doing doing so, it needs really three components: it needs torpedo speed, it needs target speed, and it needs angle on bow. Once you have those three parameters, you can calculate a lead angle. Range doesn't factor in unless you're introducing parallax into the equation, meaning a torpedo that has to turn. If you're just assuming straight, pure lead angle, torpedo speed, target speed, and angle on bow. So the we have to order target speed first, and that is because, or excuse me, we have to order torpedo speed first, and that is because what shows on the target speed dial is actually dependent on uh, on torpedo speed and so what it's doing is when it's computing the lead angle the, the formula for lead angle is target speed over torpedo speed times the sine of the angle on bow the ratio target speed over torpedo speed is you that ratio is used by the computer and it's introduced and it's modified by the target speed dial so what that means is if I set target speed first to say 10 knots and then the skipper says, oh, wait a minute, I want torpedo speed, I don't want torpedo speed 40, I want torpedo speed 30. Well, he's the operator is going to switch the torpedo speed up here, and all of a sudden he's going to see his target speed jump down. And it's because what's happening is the computer is trying to keep the same ratio of target speed to torpedo speed. And so if the torpedo speed were 40 before, then, and he ch changes it down to 30, the computer is going to adjust target speed down to maintain the same ratio, to maintain the same fraction, okay? So that's why torpedo speed has to be entered first, unchanged. Enter it in, and now we order target speed. So it's tor torpedo speed 30, target speed 16. So he sets torpedo speed up here to 30, he uses the, the Gegnerfahrt crank here to set target speed to 16. Now the computer has the ratio of target speed over torpedo speed, and it will then use the angle on bow that's set to compute the lead angle. Okay. Next comes angle on bow. Bow right, AOB 60. So what the operator has to do, even though the, tor even though the switch for AOB tracking is off, he pushes this um, tab here 
and he turns this knob down here to adjust the AOB to 60 right. And he has to push this because he wants to keep the pointers on the, on the course angle dial aligned. And we'll see why that is in a, in, a, in a few minutes. So he pushes the tab here, he turns the knob here, and he sets it to 60 right. And then he releases, this is spring-loaded, this is spring-loaded down here, so he'll release that tab. Now comes range, range 1300. The operator comes up here and cranks this over to show 1300. Okay, and next comes target length, target length 150. This is the target length knob. He would set this to 150, just an est it's an estimate of the target's length, and this is for spread angle. Okay, all right. So now let's say so now, and this switch over here is set to blue by default, it's set to not follow or don't follow. Nicht folgen. This would be it would be up, and you would see this light here would be shining blue. And that means that right now I am the the uh, the bearing tran the target bearing transmitter that's selected on the switch box below in the control room. In this case, the attack periscope is not sending bearings to the TDC. Well, it is really, but what's happening is you can think of it that way. But what's happening here is um, the the bearing motor has been cut off. Has has power has been cut to the bearing motor so any change in the inner so the inner pointer will still change for every degree of bearing change of the optics but the outer pointer will not follow it anymore so the bearings are still being transmitted but the motor is not active in order to synchronize it because the this switch is saying don't follow so the outer pointers would stay would stay put the inner pointers would 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 move but again the outer pointer is really what matters to the computer okay but so that's it's not following as of right now okay so what that means is then like this dial won't change because the outer pointers aren't moving it's just the inner pointers the trans that are being transmitted that from the reflective bearing that's being transmitted from the uh, bearing transmitters that's moving but the computer's bearing is not okay all right so now we've got we've got those data entered. All right, we've got the other thing now we have to do is the spread angle that's being computed by the computer because we have the, remember we have the spread angle motor on. So what the spread angle component is doing is it's taking it's taking angle on bow, it's taking um, it's taking target, it's taking range, and it's taking angle on bow, and it's computing the spread angle. It's computing the angular width of the target. Okay, it's to, it's basically saying at this AOB, at this range, that target is X number of degrees wide, and it's displaying that here. And then, and then the computer is transmitting this value as well to the forward gyro angle receiver. And the operator of the gyro angle receiver will see that on the inner pointer here. So you can see the spread angle that this particular operator is seeing is 2 degrees. At that point, he turns his wheel so that the outer pointer aligns with the inner pointer. And that is introducing the correct ratios into the, tor into the torpedoes, into the gyro angles of the torpedoes. Now a word about spread angle. Every game gets this wrong. Wolfpack may get it wrong. I'm not entirely sure. I have not tested it. But certainly Silent Hunter does and U-Boat does. The angle that's on this dial is not the entire dispersion of the spread. It is the angle between each individual torpedo. The purpose of a German spread was to ensure one hit on uncertain data at long range or whatever the case may be. But you want one torpedo to hit. So what does that mean? For a spread of two, this would indeed be the dispersion between both of those torpedoes. For a spread of three, it would be the total dispersion of all of those torpedoes would be two times this angle. And for a spread of four, the total dispersion would be three times this angle. You're casting a wide net and hoping that one of those torpedoes hits. That's what the Germans used the spread for. 
They didn't use, if they wanted all shots to hit, like a, what they called a Mehrfachschuss, Mehrfachschuss was a multiple shot where they intended all of the torpedoes to hit the target. What they would do is they would fire and then wait till the next part of the of the of the target cross the wire and fire again or they could just simply shift fire because they have that connectivity with the optics they can just point at one point of the, on the target and fire and slew over to the forward mast and fire there there's no need to use like the Americans did a certain pre-computed spread and then set those into the torpedoes no spread was simply to ensure one hit based on bad data and that's reflective of how the mechanics work here okay all right, so the spread angle is now set in the torpedoes. We're good there. All right, now the commander is, is, is continuing to scan, but he hasn't ordered follow yet. So the, so the ang uh, angle tracking, so to speak, bearing tracking is still not happening in the computer yet. Until now. So now the commander says, folgen. He says, follow. All right, the operator of the TDC switches this switch down to follow the blue light goes off the bearing outer pointer synchronizes with the inner pointer now and will continue to stay synchronized as long as the optics are moved okay if the commander wants to go off target and look around he will order blue don't follow because he does not want the gyro as every movement of the optics as long as the motor is following, will translate to movement in the gyro, delicate gyro spindles, and he doesn't want that to happen. And so he orders blue, don't follow if he wants to get off target. The, the, the regulations were, if your wire leaves the target, order blue off. Don't follow, or order blue, don't follow. And don't order follow again until your optics are back on the target. They, did, they didn't mess around with that. They, that was the stricture with that okay so now the commander has gotten on target and he's ordered follow all right so operator has flicked the switch now the bear he's verifying that the bearing is tracking in the system and he's saying bearing is following bearing is x and the commander will look at his bearing and says yes indeed that is x so we know we're good there okay now as he's slewing remember the aob motor is still not on yet so as he's slewing, assuming the, 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 assuming the submarine is still on the same course, the inner pointer is locked to the same course because it's, it's got connectivity to the gyro compass. But as he scans to the right, the outer pointer will slowly move around this way until he then orders Lage laufend, which means start AOB tracking or AOB continuous. When the commander orders that, the operator comes down here, turns this motor on. Now the AOB, which he's set to 60, okay, the AOB motor detects, because there's a disparity in these pointers here, the AOB motor d detects that disparity and realigns AOB until this pointer aligns with the inner pointer again. And it will change AOB by that amount. Now think about that. AOB 60 was ordered initially. The commander says follow. He follows the target for maybe three degrees, let's say. Okay. And then he orders Lage laufend. When he turns the AOB motor on, the AOB will show 63, not 60. And that's important because this this interplay between these dials made it made sure that because of these the way these pointers work, if you order an AOB and then you change the bearing, when you flick on the AO, the AOB motor, you should have the correct AOB to account for that bearing change. I ordered 60 right when my optics was at say 15 degrees and then I follow the target I'm watching I'm watching I'm watching 15 16 17 18 Lage laufend flick the switch the this uh, outer pointer has in those in that time moved one two three degrees this way 
when Laga laufen is switched, bzz, it'll zip right back again because AOB changes by three degrees. Now AOB is showing 63. And so the operator would say Lage ist laufend, Lage 63. So AOB is following, or AOB is continuous, AOB 63. It took me a long time to realize when I was studying this document and studying the schematics for the fire control system and the operating documents of the fire control system, how that example went from 60 to 63 and it dawned on me, wait a minute, it's because the way this pointer works, it tracks that bearing change until you turn the AOB motor on and then it, it detects that bearing change by way of like contacts on either side of this dial and it'll and then the motor will kick in it will realign this by adjusting the AOB so that these pointers are aligned again so now now we've changed bearing by three degrees we're at 63 right now which should be correct if it's not correct the commander will order a new bearing to, or a new AOB and again the operator will have to push this tab down here to turn the connection off with the gyro compass temporarily so that these pointers are aligned and no error signal is generated so that he can then turn this because if he doesn't click this now that the AOB motor is on every time he turns this AOB knob he's going to he's going to say he's going to turn it okay 60 80 snap to 60 again 60 80 and then you know you'd, you'd basically what would be happening is you'd be turning this knob and you'd hear the motor trying to resynchronize that because it's detecting the error signal from this dial as you're changing AOB and it's trying to realign the pointers and it's doing that by way of changing AOB again okay so that's important okay so the other thing to know is that I mentioned parallax before, and I guess let's cover this just quickly before we move on. So this is the parallax dial up here, and it's got an inner pointer and it has an outer pointer. Again, the outer pointer is what is introduced is the is what the calculator is using as its value, and the inner pointer is what is with the other side of the implicit equation. And what I mean by implicit equation is, in order to derive the gyro angle, you need parallax, and in order to get parallax, you need gyro angle. So how does that how's that supposed to work? Well, it works by way of the, of, of the, the parallax system in this computer has two components. One is driving the inner pointer and the other one is driving the outer pointer. And they are constantly readjusting vis-a-vis -vis each other until the pointers align by way of the parallax motor. It's solving the implicit equation by working to align the pointers so that one isn't so even though one value is dependent on the other the the way the component works in there is it's it's able to make enough small adjustments in order to realign the pointers and solve that implicit equation okay um, but it's worth noting that every time parallax changes AOB is going to change uh, assuming assuming the AOB motor is off and you can make free changes to AOB every time you change parallax AOB is going to change that's because you are basically what's happening is you're you you're what matters to the computer is what's called the equivalent point of fire that's the, that's the point uh, that's roughly the equivalent uh, of where the torpedo kind of gets on course and goes toward the target it's not, whereas what this is showing is actually the AOB from where you are s sitting from the optics what you're observing at that point well what the computer cares about is is 28 meters and some odd meters forward where the torpedo is going to get on course and leave the boat and then get on course it cares about what that what the AOB is from that perspective and so every change if I change parallax by five degrees it's going to change the AOB by five degrees and in order by and by me changing the AOB back to what it should be I'm introducing that parallax correction into the computer that's how the parallax correction works in here okay and to think, and parallax is it's a function of of um, bearing, it's a function of range, and it's a function of, of gyro angle. Okay, it doesn't you know range. The only reason there's a range setting on the computer is so that parallax is correct. The uh, this is the dial for not for impact angle. This is the dial for lead angle. 
lead angle, the lead angle component doesn't accept range because it doesn't need it. It only needs torpedo speed, target speed, and AOB. Um, but this range setting is strictly f feeds into the into the parallax uh, calculation. That's the only reason it's there. Okay, but that's that's something important to know is the way you actually introduce parallax into the system is by way of AOB. You it, parallax changes, which will change your AOB ever so slightly, and then by you changing AOB back, you're introducing that parallax correction into the computer. Okay. All right. So we've got AOB continuous on Lagerlöffend. We're following the target every every degree that the that the commander changes. Um, his bearing changes the optics. We'll update the AOB now by a, by a degree. Okay, it's one for one. One for one. So as he's scanning to the right, he's watching. We're watching the AOB grow. Okay, and it's because every time he turns the optics, this outer pointer is struggling to go this way, but it can't because it's triggering the the uh, AOB motor to adjust. AOB the other way and keep the pointer aligned. Okay. All right. So he's following. He's following. He's following. Now he says fan ready green two. So now he's getting ready to shoot. So he's he's making the fan. He's he wants uh, everybody to stand by and he's about to fire. But he says green two. What does green two mean? Well, we come down to this dial here. And this says Drehgeschwindigkeit. That's turning speed. So the S3 could actually take uh, the boat's turning speed into account because there was actually a lag, a very very slight lag of about a, about about 0.4 seconds, um, where that it, it took the a, a 0.4 second delay in the gyro setting mechanism um, to the extent that if you turned too quickly that lag could actually throw off your shot because the gyro angle can't adjust for your course change um, quick enough. And so this this actually allows the computer to take that into account. So what it does is you would turn this to the two mark, to the right, green being starboard. You turn that that way, and what it does is it introduces a little bit of a correction into the it does it by way of the bearing dial. So as you turn this to two, you would actually see the bearing outer pointers slightly turn the other way. And it's basically like providing a little bit of an offset to account for that um, that lag. As that's what that's doing. And you'd say two, you'd set it to two because that would be the, um, like a, your, um, the, the speed that, the turning speed that it, corresponds to the uh, amount of rudder you're going to lay in, in your own speed, okay? So so green 2. So that's my turning turning speed um, to starboard based on my own speed and uh, like the rudder angle, which is probably right full rudder at submerged. Okay? Alright, so now this they start the turn. As the commander, as the boat turns... The commander is keeping the target in the optics, so that means if you're, we're turning to the right, the bearing is going to the left. But since we are going to the right, the movement in the outer pointer here stays about the same. Every degree of course change, as this as this inner pointer moves to the right as we turn, it's triggering the AOB motor to go one way to move the AOB one way, and as the bearing is changing, going the other way, it's triggering the AOB motor to move the other way. So if we turn a degree to the right and we move the optics degree to the left, the AOB stays the same. If we turn another degree to the right and we turn the optics another degree to the left, the AOB stays the same because the computer is taking own, that, and that is how the computer is taking own course changes into account. It's all by way of the relative movement of these two pointers, own course and bearing an AOB. As long as those get out of line, the bearing, uh, the AOB motor kicks in and, and uh, realigns the AOB to what it should be. So as long as the optics are on target, just like in Wolfpack, as long as you keep the optics on target, the AOB will always be correct. 
very very important feature of this of this computer okay so the boat is turning we're about to shoot he's keeping the optics on the target the operator is watching this lamp here which is the Schusswinkel Deckung, this Deckungslampe, the, the, um, as soon as that turns white, as soon as that turns white, he will yell Deckung, which basically means matched, or it's covered, or matched, um, and that means that the gyro angle in the forward gyro angle receiver is within a couple of degrees of what it should be. Okay, and the inner pointer and the outer pointer are almost aligned. In other words, by the time the shot happens, they will be aligned. So that, when he yells that, he, when he sees this lamp light up, he knows that at the gyro angle, the gyro angles in the torpedoes are within uh, a couple of degrees of what's showing on his dials here. And then they're good to shoot. Now, let's look at an instance where that might be a, where you might have a problem with your gyro angle. Like torpedoes for most of the war were, were limited to 90 degrees to the right and to the left. I think a lot of games have you going out to like 135 degrees. Not the case. Not until loot came around. Uh, when loot torpedoes came, they could fire over 180 degrees to either side. Not the case for most of the war. It was, it was um, 90 to the, to the right and to the left. And this is, I should have gotten a better picture here, but this is poor quality. But the way the gyro angle dial worked is you've got, you can see the four dot ones are for four, a spread of four, the three dot ones are for a spread of three, and the two dot ones are for a spread of two. What happens here is based on, um, based on the, uh, the settings in the computer, these sli are sliders and they would, they would slide apart. Like this one would slide down here and this one would slide up here and it would reveal a red background. And if this line here, this indicator line, fell into that red background, that means at least one or more torpedoes would fall outside of the 90 degree range. Okay, meaning you basically can't, the torpedo can't turn anymore and you can't complete the spread as as set because one of the torpedoes is going to fall outside of the spread outside of the permissible angle okay that's what these are so as these moved and you can actually see this these are already moved this here even though it's a black and white picture that's the red background that's showing these have separated you can see there's the end of that one and there's the end of that one They're, they move apart and reveal a red background and as this line moves into that red background it's an easy way for the operator to see whether or not, yeah, here we go, whether or not a part of that spread is going to fall outside of 90, 90 degrees, okay? So that's another thing for him to check as he's doing this, all right? Okay, so we've said Deckung, we can fire. So what happens then is the torpedo launching lever is pulled. Here is a launching lever. We looked at the one that's the u 995 has been significantly painted over. But this is what it would look like, sort of out of the box. Off, shoot. All right, and then you got a lock. You got a safety mechanism here to lock it. Okay. So on the order los. So he first he'd say fecha. So fan. Dot 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 dot. Wait eight seconds because he needs to give the chief engineer time to make the necessary adjustments for trim for firing. That's why he inserts an eight-second pause. Fan eight seconds. Los, okay, los. The uh, the TDC operator is just right next to the TDC. He would pull this switch down, electrically fire the torpedoes. The torpedoes would go out every like 2.3 seconds based on the timing switch in the control room. He didn't even need to hold this lever down. He would pull it and pull it back up again. The timing switch made it was constructed so, such that um, each torpedo would fire at that correct interval until the last torpedo fired and then it would shut the switch off. It was just like a series of timing cams and this is how that would work. And as soon as the last one would was done, then the cams were all turned as far as they were going to turn and the, the thing would shut off. Okay? That's how that that's how the fan worked. But we but notice we're turning. We're still turning and we're firing. So does that mean that we have to keep the optics like we're we're turning 
and firing a fan, but I'm standing here at the I'm sitting here at the periscope. Do I need to make sure that I have my optics center mass in the target, or wh where do I need to put my optics? Well, the German engineers who made the computer actually thought that through, and they said, well we have this firing while turning setting on here and we have a firing while on straight course the firing while turning setting if 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 we're going to allow our guys to be doing that we don't want to have to make them keep the optics on the target for the entire spread because that's you know that's upwards of eight seconds of you know excitement and adrenaline going on and maybe you're trying to scan for other um threats or whatever or other targets in the area as your spread is leaving the boat we don't want it so that the that the shooter has to actually keep the optics on target so what they did was they made a another magnetic coupling in there that when the when the when the correct setting on the switch box was set to fa shooting while turning the second the firing lever was closed to shoot the bearing motor decoupled from the optics and instead of that the computer took as bearing change course change it took course change as bearing change because again every degree of of course change is going to be one degree of bearing change of the target you if you if you turn to the right one degree you have to turn the optics to the left one degree in order to see the target and so um and so it the computer momentarily for that for the duration of the spread anyway um, took course change as a proxy for bearing change, and and that what that did was it, it decoupled the bearing motor from the optics, so that the optics could while the fight while the spread was going on you could turn the optics any which way you wanted, it the computer read your course change your as bearing change as a proxy okay. So that's actually pretty innovative, and and it made it so that the, you didn't have to keep the bearing or the optics perfectly on target in order to direct your spread. Okay. Okay. So that's how that that's how that works. And so so now the shot has fallen. It, the shot's done. The last torpedo has has left the tube. The operator, of the TDC, does two things. He selects not don't follow. So blue light on, which 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 decouples the bearing motor. And then he switches the motor for Lage Laufend off. He switches the AOB motor off for AOB tracking. And at that point, you can turn the optics. Nothing's going to happen unless you turn the knobs manually. Okay. And why he does that right after the last shot is fired, last torpedo leaves, is because he has to document all the settings for the torpedo firing report that had to be filled out for every torpedo that left the boat it toward a target. So he, he it basically froze the computer in time. These were my settings at the shot, and he could jot all of those down, and then they could log them in to the firing report that needed to be signed by the commander. Okay? All right. So that's, we've got everything now frozen on here. Okay? We document it. Uh, we would go back down, and um, we would set, we'd set the computer back to the default settings, which... I won't run through what those are, but suffice it to say, you'd basically set most everything to zero. The target speed would be something like 15 knots, and then range anywhere from like 1,000 to 1,500 meters. Uh, but AOB would be zero. You'd reset all those to the default settings when you were done, and you do that by the knobs, right? So like target speed is here. Parallax I didn't cover this one yet, but if you wanted to adjust parallax manually to adjust the outer pointer manually, you would use this knob up here. We talked about the torpedo speed already. This one on the face of the computer is the bearing, is the knob for bearing. Um, if you wanted to move the outer pointer by hand, if follow was off, you would do it by way of this knob up here. We talked about the AOB one down here. This one is for spread angle. If you were to want to set the spread angle manually by hand, the outer pointer, you would turn the knob for that. Um, and then, and that's it. Those are the, really the only uh, knobs on here that we haven't covered yet. And so, um, so you've got the you've got the computer really set to the default settings that you want again. Uh, you would then go down to your switch boxes and you would set everything to off. So bottom setting, bottom setting, 
Same thing here, bottom setting, bottom setting, and then this doesn't have an off one. I guess to the side maybe, switch it. Uh, so you set those to off, and then you would go in your on your gyro angle receiver, you'd turn the motor switch off here, shut that off, and then you would, very important, you would reset these all these pointers by way of the of the wheel. You'd set it, reset them all to zero again. Okay, reset them to zero. And then the last thing you would do is you'd go to your fire control switch box and you would do the reverse. You would switch this um, this to off to cut the power. And then if you wanted to turn the converters off, you would switch this then. To the bottom setting, which would shut the uh, torpedo, excuse me, shut the fire control converter off, as well as the gyro setting uh, motors off. All right, and then you would switch your your switch for your firing, your launching system. You'd switch that off, and then you'd switch the 110 volt direct current to the uh, to the converters off as well. And then you were, that's it. That is the Entire fire, the entire operation of the fire control system in a, in a nutshell through a simulated attack. Uh, a few, just a few additional things on here that I didn't, or really one thing that I didn't point out, or two things I guess I didn't point out specifically are the top left dial is actually in the the default computer was Fahad Vinka, so that's actually your lead angle. Uh, in it in the Iteration of Wolfpack, it's impact angle, and that's because 995 has it as impact angle. Because when loot was introduced, the uh, Lag Unabhängige Torpedo, that uh, impact angle was actually an important setting in the loot um, device up in the forward torpedo room. So the, the TDC actually replaced the lead angle dial with impact angle at that point in time late in the war. Um, why might you ask is like what value has lead angle on the computer when all you really care about is the gyro angle and it feeds into the gyro angle calculation anyway so why do you need to know lead angle and it's because you can you if the if the electricity of the system goes down you can still use this as a mechanical calculator to calculate lead angle you would basically just enter all your settings in as you normally would and then you know the fixed gyro angle that you want to set in the computer. Let's say it's zero. You say, okay, I want to fire a zero fixed gyro angle, or I want to fire a 45 degree to the right fixed gyro angle. You would set that in the computer, but as you're changing your values, the gyro angle is changing mechanically, and so you would take the bearing knob and you would adjust the bearing knob. Say, I change AOB, oh, gyro angle change. Use bearing knob to move the, move the gyro angle back. Okay, tar set target speed. Oop, gyro angle changed. I set by way of the bearing knob. I set the gyro angle back to where it should be. Um, and you're just doing that iteratively until your all your settings are correct. Your gyro angle is correct as you pre preset it to be. And then you look at the lead angle and say, okay, guy at the periscope, set your lead angle slider on the scope to be 10 degrees or whatever and the bearing then should indicate on the outer pointer the bearing should indicate the shoot bearing so that's how you would actually use the device as a mechanical calculator to figure out your shoot bearing and your lead angle based on a fixed gyro angle okay so that's why there's a lead angle dial here it doesn't seem intuitive at first because you're like why does that why is that needed like the, sure the computer needs to know that but like i don't need to know that if well, if it's computing gyro angle for me it's because you can use this again as a as a me mechanical calculator to to figure that out okay the next thing here i didn't cover is this knob here and then this down here this is reichweite and this is reichentfernung um so this knob here turns little like a little plate under here that has, as you turn it, it brings another value in hectometers uh, in view. So, and it's it's a way, it's a reference disk, basically under here to say this is my the reach of my torpedo. So, say you're firing, like for instance, a um, um, like a T2 that has a, a range of like 5,000 meters. You would set 
this to 50 and it's a reminder to you to say that's all it does it just sets a little plate down here that says 50 and then what you look down here each of these lines here you can see are actually um, they actually correspond to those uh, torpedo reaches one will say 3500 one will say 50 or 35 one will say 50 one might say 80 one might say 12 uh, 120 for like 12,000 meters they're based they're based on the ranges of the torpedoes um, like the range that your and until your torpedo essentially you know runs out of fuel or runs out of battery um, and what it's doing is it's showing you the maximum range at which you can shoot and still hit the target and so let's just say for argument's sake you've got a target that's coming coming toward you um, you know coming slightly toward you maybe AOB 60 or 70 or whatever at a certain speed um, and you have a torpedo that that's gonna go 5,000 meters before it runs out of steam okay and you would see, you would find the 50 line where it intersects this scale right here you would read off so like right here you can see I can't read these numbers but you can see let's say we're reading this this line here corresponds to 50 right and it says like maybe 80 up here it means that I can still shoot when the range is 8,000 meters because by the time the target gets to the torpedo and vice versa the range will be 5,000 meters that's what that's doing it's saying based on the parameters in the computer when my torpedo will my will my torpedo even reach the target by the time it gets to its maximum run that's what that's doing okay that was always a feature in the TDC that was even in the old versions as well something to that effect okay so I think that's everything I don't think I missed anything on here these are drying sockets liftung liftung you can uh, you can attach a device to blow the insides with air um, and dry out the insides in case they got wet that's really all I think that's the only last thing to really cover about this so that's all there is to know about the fire control system I didn't leave much out so apart from some pretty esoteric details that I didn't already didn't cover in the video but if anybody has any additional questions about the system um, I know a lot about it and I'm your guy and so you know please you know keep me informed if you if you wanna uh, learn more about it reach out to me um, you know the the Wolfpack one it it's the I will say it's the first iteration of the TDC to get Lagerlaufend correct in terms of the of the of the functionality of it of taking own course changes and bearing and um, bearing changes into account when you're figuring your when AO when it's computing AOB. So kudos to them for doing that. And I remember years ago reaching out to them and saying, "Hey, are you guys considering you know this Lagerlaufend functionality?" And they and they said, "Yes, we are." And I said, you know, thank thank God for that, because I mean that is that's not something that's in SH three or SH five. If you change course in those games, you have to reset your AOB again. Whereas in the real computer, at least in the S three model, the most prevalent model, you could change course and you could change bearing, um, and the AOB will still be correct as long as you keep the optics on target. So hey, so I got I I have to hand it to them. Um, they did a, a great job in, in implementing that that functionality. Um, if they want to make other changes to the TDC, again, that's sort of why I'm making these videos. It's it's just it's a question of 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 knowing the way things worked, and then seeing these videos or you know seeing this information, and saying, hmm, you know, I could we could make this or make that or whatever or change it. Maybe this won't be so hard. Maybe this, you know, I could see a gameplay opportunity here. It's really that's really what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to teach people on the one hand, and then also try to maybe give the developers some ideas based on how things really functioned uh, if they do want to make changes so at any rate thank you all again for watching uh, and coming with me along me with me the, the I've called the deep dive into fire control uh, if you have any questions let me know I am always available so take care everybody